today we want to take a little more time and uh, take a little bit deeper dive into polynomials, specifically polynomials with real coefficients. Your first calculus class is always a uh, real calculus class. We have functions of real numbers. Calculus get, uh, changes a little bit if we start allowing the inputs to be other things like complex numbers or vectors. But we always start off with real uh, valued functions for our calculus class. So let's talk about a polynomial with real coefficients. So the generic polynomial with real coefficients will be c0 plus c1 x minus a to the, the first plus c2 x minus a squared plus some constant times x to some uh, non-negative integer power. So we go all, out, all the way out to the leading term, cn x minus a to the n. Now this minus a part just means that we can focus our polynomial at any real number. So yesterday we talked about the standard form of a quadratic function, a ax squared plus bx plus c, where er, all, these are all x to the first, x squared, and so on. So that would be x minus zero would be the, would be the, the terms. But we also looked at the vertex form, a times x minus h squared plus k. There, the focus is at x minus h. So that's like the center of your polynomial. So <clears throat> the things that make this a polynomial is that we start counting at zero and we go up to n, some non-negative integer. That will be the degree of the polynomial. Whatever term we get the degree of the polynomial, that's where we'll find what we call the leading coefficient. And so in general, our polynomial will have all these constants, C0, C1, C2, up to Cn, where n is a non-negative integer and a and all the, all the ci are real numbers. So we have some math symbols here. I can't remember if we've seen these before, but if we draw this funky looking e, that is an abbreviation for is an element of, where a and ci are elements of r, and this double r is the set of real numbers. And this upside down a is read as for all. So for all i from zero up to n, which really covers all the i. So C, the coefficients C, I are all real numbers and A is a real number. That means our polynomial will have all real coefficients. Here's one of the things that we were getting at yesterday. A polynomial with real coefficients is a product of irreducible polynomials of first and second degree. This is why we, need, we study so much about quadratics and then kind of stop. We don't go separately into cubic polynomials because cubic polynomials will just be the product of either three first degree polynomials or a first degree polynomial and a second degree polynomial. A fourth degree polynomial, we don't study those separately from quadratics because a fourth degree polynomial will either be the product of two second degree polynomials, a second and two firsts, or four firsts. Those are the possibilities for a fourth degree polynomial as, as far as how it factors goes. One thing that I've used here is the word irreducible. And irreducible is, is not the same thing as prime. Irreducible depend, uh, uh, means factorable, but it depends on what we're allowed to use in our factorization. So I need to talk a little bit about this word irreducible. So irreducible depends on what we're allowed to use for coefficients.
So this depends on what we're, the irreducible means, it depends on what we're using for coefficients. So for example, if I have the polynomial uh, x squared, which direction do I wanna go? Let's go with x squared plus nine. This polynomial has integer coefficients and we would call this a prime polynomial because it has integer coefficients, which are also real coefficients. And I can't factor it over the real numbers. So when we say a polynomial is prime, that means it has integer coefficients and is not factorable over rational numbers. So we can call x squared plus nine a prime polynomial because it has integer coefficients and it's not factorable using rational numbers. Note that it is factorable if we're allowed to use complex numbers. So x squared plus nine is factorable over the complex numbers. x squared plus nine is factorable over complex numbers. We have zeros of plus and minus three i. If we saw, if we set x squared plus nine equals zero, then x squared is equal to negative nine. So x is the plus and minus square root of negative nine, which is plus or minus three i. So I can write x squared minus x squared, sorry, x squared plus nine as x plus three i and x minus three i. So if we use complex numbers, if we're allowed to use complex numbers, x squared plus nine is factorable. If we restrict ourselves to real numbers, it's not factorable. So x squared plus nine is irreducible over the real numbers. Another example, x squared minus seven, we would describe as uh, uh, prime as well because seven is not a square. The, we have x squared minus seven has integer coefficients and it's not factorable over the rational numbers. But it is factorable if we are allowed to use irrational numbers. So it's irreducible over rational numbers, but it is reducible if we are allowed to use real numbers. So x squared minus seven is irreducible over the rational numbers. So we would say x squared minus seven is prime. But if we solve the equation, x squared minus seven equals zero, we still get two solutions, real solutions. X, is, x squared is equal to seven. So x is plus or minus the square root of seven. That means that x squared minus seven is factorable over the real numbers.
because I can write x squared minus seven as x uh, minus square root of seven times x plus the square root of seven. We shorthand this when we're in an algebra class. We just say, this is not factorable. But we leave off the part where it's not factorable over the rational numbers. Because when you're learning to factor polynomials, you want to learn to factor polynomials over the rational numbers. Here's an important thing that we want to note. Recall yesterday, we said that the number of turns that a graph of a polynomial will make is less than the degree by an odd number. So it's one less or three less or five less and so on. The reason for that is that the, the turns are gonna be determined by the zeros of the derivative. So recall, the number of turns a polynomial graph makes is less than the degree by an odd number. The number of turns a polynomial function makes is going to be less than the degree by an odd number. So it'll be one less. three less, five less, and so on. Today, we wanna to think about why this is. The turns of a polynomial function are found by looking at the derivative of a polynomial function. We find the turns of a polynomial function by salt of uh, say polynomial function P of X by solving P prime of X equals zero. We look at the derivative of the, of the function, set it equal to zero and solve. P prime of X will be one degree less than P of X. Since the derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus one, we subtract one from the exponent. P prime of x is uh, degree one less than P of x. So if P of X is degree N, P prime of X is degree N minus one. So the number of solutions that P of X, uh, P prime of X can have is at most N minus one, one less than the degree of P of X.
I'll put at most in parentheses because it most definitely has n minus one complex zeros counting multiplicities, but we're concerned with the real zeros. The turns of a polynomial come from, uh, the turns of any graph come from the solutions of the derivative equals zero. Since the degree of P prime will be one less than the degree of P of X, number of solutions of P prime of X is gonna be N minus one. The number of real solutions to P prime of X equals zero is at most N minus one counting multiplicities. Previously, we had said that a polynomial with real coefficients is a product of irreducible polynomials of first and second degree. So a polynomial of, with real coefficients is the product of irreducible polynomials of first and second degree. The second degree irreducible polynomials are the ones that are going to produce our complex zeros. And complex zeros always come in conjugate pairs. So from these second degree polynomials, If we have a complex zero of a polynomial with real coefficients, then its conjugate must also be a complex zero of that polynomial. Complex zeros of real, value, uh, real polynomials always come in conjugate pairs. That's why we'll get an irreducible factor of second degree. So because we're taking the derivative and set it equal to zero to solve, that's why we have, at, we have the number of turns will be one less than the degree of the polynomial. It can be less than that by, a, by two because we can only cut down the number of real zeros in pairs. So the derivative thing is how we get one less than the degree of the polynomial function. And then we go by odd numbers because a complex zero takes up two, two of the zeros. So this is why it's less, uh, less than the degree of the polynomial by an odd number. So the number of turns We start off with n, the degree of the polynomial. We subtract one because we're taking the derivative. And then after that, we'll subtract in pairs.
So that's why it's always going to be an odd number less than the degree. Two K plus one will always be an odd number for if K is an integer. And we set K up as the number of pairs K is the number of complex conjugate pairs. So so this com this comes this gives us an idea about what a polyn uh, what a polynomial graph can look like. as far as the number of turns goes. We know that a square polynomial, sorry, a degree two polynomial, a quadratic, will make one turn and only one turn because the ends have to go in the same direction. A degree two polynomial can make only one turn. That's all we get to do. A degree three polynomial can make two turns or zero turns. Because a degree three polynomial, the derivative will be a degree two polynomial, and that will either have two real solutions or no real solutions, or one real solution that gets repeated. A degree four polynomial can make three turns. It can't make, a degree four polynomial can't make two turns because then the ends would go in opposite directions. And a degree four polynomial has to have ends that go in the same direction. But we can make one turn. So it can drop down and make one turn. Another way it could make one turn is that it could make a turn go flat and then keep going up. This is still only one turn because at this other critical point, it went flat, but it didn't change direction. So at these points, the graph went flat, but no direction change. So the graph in those cases went flat, but it did not change direction. So that doesn't count as a turn. A turn is a direction change. If we have a degree five polynomial, I can make four turns, two turns, or no turns. So I can make four turns, one, two, three, four. We can't make three turns because that would make the ends go in the same direction and an odd degree polynomial, the ends have to go in opposite directions. But I can make two turns. So I can go up, down and up again. We could also take up turns 
uh, or take up space by going flat, but not changing direction. So we could make two turns. where the graph still goes flat, but does not change direction. Or we could make, we can't make one turn because then the ends would go in the same direction and an odd degree polynomial, the ends have to go in opposite directions. We could have a degree five polynomial that makes zero turns. So it could just be that it's always increasing. Or it can go flat, but not change direction. Any questions? Uh, yes, Professor Lich. Uh huh. Um, could you might go back to the previous page with the uh, it said a polynomial with real coefficient. So a polynomial with real coefficients is the product of divisible polynomial of the first. You don't mind um, draw us like what does that mean, for example? Um, so when we say a, a polynomial is a product, that means we can factor it. So um, we can take x squared minus nine and write it as this product of first degree polynomials. If I have a cubic polynomial, say x cubed minus uh, 16, oh, I need cubes, eight. I can write x cubed minus eight as a product of a linear fact with a linear factor and a quadratic factor. So I can write this as x minus two times x squared plus 2x plus 4. And the x squared plus 2x plus 4 is not reducible over the real numbers. So here are two irreducible factors over the real numbers. But x squared plus 2x plus 4 is reducible over the complex numbers. If I let myself use complex numbers, I can complete the square on x squared uh, plus 2x. So x squared plus 2x plus 1 will complete the square to an x plus 1 squared. And there's a plus 4 here, so that means this must be plus 3. That's left over. So x squared plus 2x plus 4 does not have real zeros, but it does have two complex zeros. So if we set this equal to 0, our complex zeros are um, negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 3. So this polynomial is not reducible over the reals, but every polynomial is reducible over the complex numbers. So I go minus a minus one, I have a minus negative one plus square root of three. And X minus a negative one minus root three. And then I wrote these up above because I wanna simplify them. So I can have X plus one, minus root three times x plus one uh, plus root three. Oh, plus i root three.
So it was irreducible over the reals, but it's factorable over the polynomials. Oh, sorry, factorable over the complex numbers. So, so if I go back to x squared minus nine with the um, on the right, uh -huh. x minus three, x minus x three, so we call three. it uh, x plus three. Yeah. Right. Uh, factorable over complex numbers. No, it's, that's factorable over the rational numbers. That's factorable mm -hmm. over integers. And that's what we typically learn as factorable. If, for example, we have one x squared minus seven, on the previous page, that called the prime, right? Correct, Professor Lee? That is prime. A prime polynomial means we have integer coefficients and it's not factorable over rational numbers. Okay, I will look in further in this. Thanks for the drawing. I, I will look further on the YouTube for the information. Thanks. Okay. For and the I stand for imagine, imagine number, correct? Yeah, I is the square root of negative one. I, I will look at that further, thanks. Yeah, this lecture kind of over my head. I will look at it. Thanks. So the idea is we want to think about what the zeros of a polynomial function are going to be. This is because we're going to be taking derivatives of polynomial functions, setting them equal to zero, and solving. So it is helpful to think about what we know about polynomials and what polynomials can look like. We get a lot of information based on we get a lot of information based on just the leading coefficient. It tells us about the ends, if they go in the same direction or opposite directions. The leading coefficient will tell us what's happening to the right. And the degree will also tell us about the number of turns that the polynomial can make the number of possible local maximums and local minimums that we'll be finding. If you really want an old school result, oops. This is definitely Blu-ray bonus material. We should take a look at Descartes' rule of signs. Descartes' rule of signs tells us about the number of positive real root, uh, real zeros of a polynomial. The number of positive real zeros of a polynomial is equal to the number of changes in sign of the terms of a polynomial. Let's just say of the polynomial. Or is less than that. By an even number. So Descartes' rule of signs will tell you, well, you count the number of changes in sign, and that tells you how many positive real zeros, the maximum number of positive real zeros a polynomial can have. We can see that in action on this x squared plus 2x plus 4. A polynomial we know has zero real zeros. Also, if we look at x squared plus 2x plus 4, that has 
zero sign changes, so we'll have zero positive real zeros. So if you really want some obscure knowledge about polynomials, this is great polynomial trivia. So if you're hanging out with your friends on a Friday night and you start arguing over polynomials, um, this is a good obscure piece of information to drop. Any questions? I guess how obscure can it really be? It's got its own Wikipedia entry. Any questions? All right. Next week, we are going to start getting into chapter four. Chapter four is all about applications of the derivative. We've already talked a little bit about this. Uh, intervals of increase and decrease, intervals of concave up and concave down, critical points, local maxima, local minima, inflection points. So those are going to be our primary op, uh, ap applications of the derivative. We're also going to look at um, use max, local maxima and local minima to optimize some functions. So this concludes catching up week. Next week, we'll move, be moving on into uh, more new stuff in chapter four. That's going to do it for today, and that's going to do it for this week. Everybody have a good weekend, and thanks for playing.